being a documentation of my first month without you. Since the last moment I saw you, I have consumed 14 pomegranate seeds, three scarab husks, blood, bread, and on some nights, in remembrance of Leary, I have slotted tabs beneath my tongue and hollowed my cheeks to make room for breath and fog. I have eaten these oddities in deference to childhood beliefs, formerly eclipsed by you. I have spent your absence trying to travel through time, using the alchemy of memory, my gullet, and a fist to the belly. So far, the incidents where I've achieved success have been few and far between. Since the last time I felt your fingertips, I have transformed the following items. My tongue, my palms, my hips, and my memories. I've endeavored to keep my lips in the same state as when you left, so that you might have some bit of me to welcome you home, should you choose to return. I've remade all these little bits of me into components for some device locked in a memory I sacrificed in the middle of our Cold War. And what we found to replace the stretched cable steel connection between us smelted to hip and pelvis is paper thin, but safer for us. And I am content with this arrangement. Despite the danger of gravity, the flat rope of fascia that connects us paints you sepia, and with the pinkness of your lips faded to brown, I almost feel whole. Our moments of separation are not moments like others. They are not quick and gone in an instant. These lounge in the space from me to you. They tangle themselves in the web of people between us. They loop and curve and twist around one another, turn an Escher to Wright and Dolly to Kincaid, and I can feel the breaking of us. <clears throat> we, are we are caught, wrapped and stripped through meat and connective tissue down to gnawed ivory bone, a figure you'll recognize on the pads of your fingers, this weak, this weak body I've made in the name of discretion, a futile attempt to hide curled against the warm base of your back. Since the last time I saw you, I have learned the following things. The taste of your skin, the lie of my tongue on yours, the fit of your head under my chin, and the cup of your skull filling my palm. Since the last moment my fingers brushed your skin, I have learned all I need to know of planes and lines, points and parabola, and though I can no longer feel these shapes on you, when I imagine them, it is your body I see, broken down into rectangles and triangles, piled under grasping, greedy hands, and ready for reassembly. Thank you. So um, the other piece that I'm going to do is called Bagged Dinosaur. Um, for those of you who don't know, there was a call for submissions for an anthology called Bagged Dinosaur, in which that had to be the title of the poem and the subject. Um, and so this is mine. <laughs> if you look at my hands, you will notice an anomaly. Two inches below the border of my wrist, there is a ring of crosshatched skin pure white, Lavinia's branches. Because as a child, I scrabbled in dirt for my history, tore nails out on gravel, and scraped skin to pink on sidewalks, left a thin film of blood on every surface I ever walked across. Then as I got older, I loaded the flesh of my hands with hundreds of cuts, digging through piles of paper labeled history until a sanitized edge cut through radius and ulna. Somehow through travel, I lost track of lost hands, packing them in the junk box with other fallen body parts. Only years later, with borrowed hand low on dates back, would I, on dates back would I look up and see them, stitched with translucent twine, my metacarpals and phalanges fused to a recently discovered bone, reclaimed by scientists and reformed into paleontological truth, and carrying a label underneath, dinosaur, comma, faggot. Staring up at this recreation, I can't help but wonder if it's only my hands that have named it faggot. The limpness of my previous carpals, the inevitability of hanging hands, or if some other detail hinted at this. There's a placard next to the skeleton which declares, These bones were found whole in the La Brea tar pits, because where else would such a stylish thunder lizard live? <laughs> Though it measures 60 feet in height, its hands are dainty and human comparable even having opposable thumbs to pluck only the newest green shoots from the tops of trees. The fact that dinosaur does not eat meat, of course, considering the devouring of it gauche. To crystallize this decision, he would file his pointed teeth down to flats and hang among the more open-minded herbivores. But inevitably, type calls to type, 
and the faggot dinosaur would turn back to me and prey on the confused members of its pack. Then the herbivores would turn on it and more fully rip it to shreds. This is the story of my hands as remembered by science. I confront them, these scientists, these historians wearing self-satisfaction as, as tightly as their white jackets and try to explain. This combination of ivory is false. The faggotry is mine, not the sores, that perhaps this huge creature was loving, was truthful. Perhaps his faggotry, if not a reflection of my own, was soft and gentle in a way I never got to be. And perhaps any death he suffered was not his fault. But I've always talked with my hands, and these new ones don't fold as they should. They don't fly through the air to express my anger. They don't bend with my inflection or clinch with my passion. The scientist turns one to walk away, and I fall quiet, allow my deadened arms to fall, as over their shoulders they call out a reply, framed against 20 meters of bone and string. They laugh. Don't be so foolish. Who ever heard of a non-predatory faggot who stood so tall? Thank you. <laughs>